Welcome to Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Issues and Answers is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. And now, Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Welcome to the program. I'm Diane Kinderwater. Thanks for watching. And as we know, this great station is offering you a look at a lot of the candidates who are running for office. And we can't invite all of them, but we are fair and we are inviting the candidate and their opponents to be, and those who have accepted are on the air. And we're able to invite all the Senate candidates who have opponents who have some, uh, some importance or representation here in Bernalillo County. So there's a handful of state Senate races, and we're able to invite the candidates who are running. Of course, we know the election is Tuesday, November 5th. I'm going to be introducing you today to Kirsten Johnson. She's a Republican running in um, District 18, and she's going to tell you all about Senate District 18 and why she is running for this important seat in the state legislature. As we know, all the legislators are up for a vote, are up for a vote this time around, and just make sure you find the time. She's finding the time to run. You find the time to vote. So we'll be back with Kirsten Johnson right after this. Stay with us. Thanks. You probably know her name, her face, maybe you've run into her. Kirsten Johnson, not only as a candidate running for now, Senate District 18, but she's a well-known realtor in the state of New Mexico and, of course, here in Albuquerque, Bernalillo County. And now she's a guest on this program. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad Thanks to be here. Kirsten. A lot of accolades as a realtor. I really uh, was, yes. You've been appointed by, I think, Governor Susana Martinez as on the what the New real Mexico estate, Real Estate Commission, New yes, New Mexico Real Estate Commission. You're the Metropolitan Realtor of the Year, and yes. you've been practicing real estate for how many years? I'm embarrassed to tell I you. Know, I don't, you don't have to say. <laughs> Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven years. I hate to say stuff too. I say, well, the past millennium. Yeah, it's not only the past able... decade, but the past millennium. Yes. You started. That's a fantastic long career. Yeah, it, it really has been. It, it, it was an accident. I kind of stumbled into it, and it's been the best thing I've ever done. You know, between uh, the people and the houses, I haven't been bored a single day in 37 years, you can imagine. Born and raised in the South Valley? Or in the, in the North, North Valley. Valley of yes. The so Valley High School graduate? Valley High School, yes. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I was raised at the end of a little dead-end street right off of Campbell and Rio Grande Boulevard. And my dad worked for the public schools. He was a counselor at a middle school, Wilson Middle School. My mom started as a teacher as well. She was also raised in the Valley. She grew up down on Matthew. And she worked for the city for many, many years, retired as a municipal bond specialist. They both told me to work for the government, to do something where you have a retirement and um, where you have weekends off. In fact, uh, many years with my dad, he would call me and working on a Sunday and he'd say, you know, if you had become a librarian like I told you, you would be oh, off this funny. Sunday. <laughs> so, were you a rebellious young woman not to listen to your dad for the complete opposite to have weekends off? Well, I was kind of a funny little character actually. So I'm adopted. That's part of my story. And I think my folks didn't quite know what to do with me. I was uh, not probably what they expected and they couldn't necessarily anticipate what I would do and neither could I. And I, for instance, when I was 12, I told my dad I want to work. And dad said, Kirsten, you have your whole life to work. You don't need to work. So I did what all 12 year old girls do when their dad says no. I developed a marketing plan and I delivered flyers to the neighborhood, to Thomas Village. And before long, I had a babysitting job <laughs> and I've worked ever since I was 12. And that was kind of not what they would have expected for me. But I, I think I was born with a drive, and um, that is something that you can't deny is how you're wired when you're born. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I've got a similar story. You do? Oh, how interesting. We'll have Started to Started a date like a daycare center. Not a daycare, uh, with a, a friend of mine. Put out the flyers, and like 11, 12 years old, we mm -hmm. wanted to earn money. Right. Pay our way. Right, and exactly. have independence. That's, I think that's what it meant to mm -hmm. me. And purpose. Not being beholden, even on my parents. If mm -hmm. I wanted to go on a trip, I had to earn my money. Exactly. If I wanted to buy a car, I had to do it. So not beholden on a parent or government, which, sad to say, we see a lot of that in our community that they're beholden on government for a handout because our government has freely given our tax, buy mm -hmm. our tax dollars to someone else. 
Well, and, and I take it to another level too, is I, I have such a strong belief in purpose. You know, I think when you have purpose, you have a reason to get up every day and you have self-confidence and uh, a reason to live. And through that purpose, you're contributing back to your community. And for instance, one of the people I work with, when she's become my dear friend, she's my assistant, she's 92. She shines brighter than anyone I know. We all look to her as our hero. And one of the things that she would tell you is the thing that brings her joy and puts that light shining out of her is the purpose that she has every day. And I think, you know, when you drill down to the complex issues that we're dealing with in Albuquerque today, including homelessness, I think part of this you can, nobody has an answer for homelessness and or, or for a solution for it. But one of the things that I think is if we look at the education system and the fact that it is 52, we are at the bottom and people who live here don't necessarily have access to good education, which leads to purpose, which leads to putting back into our community. I think that is one thing to consider that people aren't necessarily looking at when we're thinking of homelessness. Purpose, definitely. Self-reliance. Mm -hmm. Give up. I mean, that's a purpose. If the government's going to give us anything, we don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Then what's our purpose? Right. But if government shows you the way with a good education, as they say, to fish rather than giving the fish, right. you have a purpose. Right. And you, this 92-year-old woman is still working for you. Yes, she is phenomenal. I have to sometimes ask her to remind me of things. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She oh, is, that's cute. She's phenomenal. Oh, that is cute. Mm -hmm. How wonderful. And she's able to survive this long for her purpose. Fantastic. Yes. What a wonderful story. You've got a wonderful story here, and you want to ruin it all by running for office? Yeah. yeah <laughs> and I'm you, kidding about that. Yeah, Again, you, appreciate you, <laughs> as all the candidates that we've invited, to make the effort to run for office. Thank you. It's not an easy, it's not an easy no, thing no, at all. Not. And you're giving to us. You and the other candidates want to give us something. True. And, and what I want to give is a solution. I am somebody, as I said, I enjoy working. Um, there's a saying, when, when I was done being the president of the Board of Realtors, one of my mentors, a man named Jim Maddox, came up and he patted me on the back and he said, from the peacock to the feather duster. And I took that to heart because what I relate to that is, you know, what he was saying is when you're, not, when you're not the president anymore, you go from being the peacock on the stage to the feather duster. That was his point. Got it. But I take the point to mean I have no desire to be the peacock. I would prefer to be the feather duster. I am a worker, and I love to work. And when I see a problem, I want to solve it. So I see a problem with crime. I don't want to live in a place where I'm afraid. I don't want to see my customers moving away because they don't think we can solve it. They're voting with their feet. I don't want to see that anymore. I want to do the work to come forward and bring a solution. I want to be the feather duster in the committees. I want to do all the committee work. I want to solve this. I want to bring bills. I want to detain people who are dangerous. I want to treat people who need treatment. And I want a safe Albuquerque. And then when I'm done, I will happily go back to my life. I love my work. I love my husband. And I have no desire to be something. I have a great desire to do something. What drove you to run for this? And I know as a realtor, and I read about your background, that a lot of, as you said, your customers, your friends who have become, you know, your friends mm -hmm. from being your customers are voting with their feet. They are moving out. Now, we hear that, but it's you true. know first. So tell, it I've heard true. that, but... Yes, you know, what we do, we meet with people who are moving. You know, that's what you do as a realtor. So you're sitting around their kitchen table and you say, well, where are you going? And I kid you not, the refrain is anywhere but here. When you hear that enough, it gets your attention. And this happened two years ago where I started noticing this trend. And then when I'd say, why? Crime education, homelessness, I cannot get an appointment with my doctor, my doctor keeps leaving, I have to go to Arizona for health care, I have to go to Denver for health care, I can't get my business to run the way I want to run it, I'm going to go to Texas, I'm going to go to Florida, I'm going to go to Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and they are going. And these are the people who are the workers. These are the people I relate to, these are the producers, these are the people who have 
businesses, they have jobs that they provide, they have, um, they give back to our communities in many ways, and they're taking that work ethic and all of that production, and they're taking it to free states where they can produce. And I got tired of seeing that. Do, do uh, Kirsten Johnson is running for Senate. Does the Board of Realtors have any say so in this? Are they, um, as an organization, shouting this out, saying this is happening? Well, you know, the Board of Other Realtors... Other than you. Well, they're, they're made up of many, many different people and many different belief systems. There's, I think, four or 5,000 realtors in Albuquerque and 14,000 licensees in the whole state of New Mexico. So that's a melting pot of ideas and beliefs. And so for some of those folks, they are um, not really noticing that people are leaving for a political reason. You know, maybe they're noticing more that people are leaving for jobs or schools or things like that. But what got my attention is moving is an uncomfortable thing to do. And if you're willing to move with no particular destination, no person you're going to, no job, no school you're going to, if you're willing to leave everything you know with no particular destination in mind, that shows a level of desperation and a lack of belief in our system here. Uh, the realtors in general, I think, they want to work and they want to support people buying and selling homes, and they may not have noticed that in the way that I did, probably related to my thought processes is how I picked up on the reasoning that I was seeing. And also, you know, we say there's a seat for every saddle and that, that you can relate that to realtors. So perhaps the customers that I drew and that I was dealing with had more of that mindset and customers who might have been drawn to uh, another type of realtor or a different personality. You know, a lot yeah. of it is personality entirely. So you never know what's gonna draw people to you. So they may not have noticed it in the same way. So if you're selling the houses, the people are moving out that you've seen experience, who's moving in? It's very interesting that you ask the question. So in a, in a 37 year career, I have heard our, our state described in many different ways. But in the last five years, I started noticing states being described as red and blue. Never in my life before had I heard that. And formerly, people would come here for jobs, for school, for the weather, for food, to retire here. And now they're coming because it's considered an affordable blue state. They, they believe in the, the legislature and the governor and how we've been led for many, many years. But California, Seattle, Washington State, New York, those places are becoming unaffordable. And so they are moving here. So that, that is one thing that's happening. But, you know, on the other hand, it's always bad to generalize. You know, we have university, we have Sandia Labs, we have um, medical school, we have many different industries that draw people here other than politics. Besides, it's beautiful, the food is wonderful, the people are friendly, there are many reasons to come here. But I do see that uh, there is now a trend of describing states in color. But that's interesting. I've never heard affordable blue state. I've heard various things disparagingly say, oh, they want to make us California. They want to make us Washington state. But, Why there are policies that ruined their states. Yes. Why don't they just stay there? Well, they're not affordable because of their high taxation and their high regulations and things. So I've just heard, not working as yeah. you are, that they're coming here to make us a mini California, but they're able to do it because it's affordable. Yeah, and I don't until think- it is, Until it isn't. Well, and I, I do like to look at intention too, and, I, and the, the folks that are coming aren't necessarily coming with the intention of turning it, in any, uh, turning it any other color or a deeper blue. It just so happens that where they're living is unaffordable. They're coming here, which is more affordable, and they will bring that belief system here so the, the organic result of that will be that we probably will turn deeper blue. But I don't think the people's intention is to do that. It's just they're coming, it's affordable here, it's beautiful, and they're bringing their beliefs with them. So state is be described as blue or red, could become even deeper blue, but you are running as a Republican. I am. So is it a lost cause? No. No, you can't believe that. You know, I think that people are getting tired of the things that are causing people to move away. You know, I'm doing something. But called, some people can't move, right? No, that's some true. Some of us cannot move. That's true. So you have to vote with your vote, not your feet. <laughs> but I'm doing something called meet me on neutral ground. Rather than going knocking on doors, which is 
uh, we're doing a little bit of that, but it's very intrusive when you knock on somebody's door. You're in their space, you're uninvited, and you're bringing maybe an idea they're not interested in hearing. So what I'm doing is going to parks throughout my whole district, and I'm saying, I want to hear what you have to say. I don't want to presume that what I think are the problems are your problems. So meet me in the park on neutral ground and tell me what your problems are. Tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, teach me. And what I'm learning is that crime is on everybody's mind. And I'm sure you're hearing this from any candidate that you visit with. Crime is on everybody's mind and crime should not be partisan. And homelessness is on everybody's mind and that should not be partisan. The doctor's leaving is on everybody's mind. It should not be partisan. So these are things that I wanna come in and solve. And I think that people in Albuquerque and throughout New Mexico are very tired of living like this. They're tired of going to Walgreens and watching people just fill bags and walk out. They're tired of seeing no consequences. They're tired of seeing people shoot up on the street. I see this all the time. I saw somebody attack another uh, on the median on Montgomery near 25. I saw it was a turf war over the median. So there's a guy, a homeless man standing there. There's another homeless man walking up the median. He has a machete. He is going to attack the man on the median with the machete. So this man jumps into traffic. This is a danger to everybody. Had somebody been looking at their phone, as many people do when they're driving, he would have been hit and killed right on Montgomery. So these things that we're seeing um, come from a lack of consequence. If we're not stopping traffic stops, we're not stopping shoplifting, we're not stopping trespassing, it's trespassing on those medians. Nobody's doing anything about it. Without consequences, we're never going to see a change. And one of the things that we need to address too is the, the number of arrests that are going on that are repeated from unfortunately people who are not competent. We need to somehow address competency because there, there was, uh, the governor is working on, on this and she in her town halls was referencing this and there was an article in the paper today about competency and it's something like these people are arrested 4,000 times and kicked out every time because they're not competent they may have raped somebody, but they're not competent, so they kick them back out, and that person will then rape somebody else. This is not acceptable. We need to find a way to detain those people. And if you can imagine that we have a place where we can treat people who are not competent until they are competent, but they are not on the street harming people, the crime is going to naturally go down because those people are repeating. repeating. But then, of course, the problem with the drugs and, and the uh, lack of education, I mean, good education for these folks, it just seems jobs are needed to give them the self-reliance. Absolutely, and, yeah. And it's tough. So regarding not just the competence, but you were saying, um, oh, no consequences in Albuquerque with right. the crime. Who's, who's responsible for not having the no confidence? Is it the legislature? Is it the city council? Yes. Is it the mayor? So you asked about you know, why I got into this, and I'm sitting around people's table, and they're, they're saying that they're going anywhere but here. So I stopped to think, okay, why? They said crime, homelessness, doctors, things like this. I said, who controls these things? The legislature obviously does. They set the rules, and they can make rules for judges. Judges, are, judges need to be held accountable, too. There are no consequences for the legislators. There are no consequences for the judges. There are no consequences for the, the education. There's no consequences for teachers. I think that we need to have measurable consequences. And judges, we need to look at judges who are kicking out people who are um, hurting the public. What kind, so consequences, uh, Kirsten, would be voters voting people out is a consequence, right. but it doesn't tend to happen. Right. They may not know what's going on. The voters might not know. I right. think if they would know, they wouldn't be voting, perhaps as they are, right. unless they want this. They want this kind of mayhem. Well, then they have it. The voters have it. And I think uh, I would like to see a way to research judges. So when you're voting for a judge, judges are appointed often, and then what you're voting for is to retain them. And most people, when they see the ballot and they see the judge's name and they see retain, retain is kind of a positive word. And people like to go in with a positive attitude sometimes. So they think, oh, well, just retain, 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 retain. They don't know the difference. And I think we need to find a way 
to uh, somehow publish what's going on with the results of the cases that judges are hearing. And if there's um, somebody who you don't agree with, you should be able to vote not to detain them, not to retain them. Correct. Yes, not to ah, retain them. Instead of retain, have not to. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't vote to retain, is, I don't recall, you retain now, is there, there's not a not retain or you just don't vote? What's the difference? Oh, I, I don't know. The, I don't know what the bubble says know. either, actually. I think it's, it's. Retain if you don't, I don't know. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a bubble do not retain. I think it's just retain. And then or the you percentage don't choose of the voters, them. yeah. I think, but I don't know. It's a good question. Yes. What are the consequences would you consider um, for teachers, for city councilors, legislators? I think the, the vote is the consequence okay. there. You know, I think the, the special. I was thinking maybe well, you had an no, idea well, the, well, the of what a consequence could be. The special session is the perfect example of this. So, I'm hearing at the parks. I'm hearing everywhere. Crime was on everybody's mind, and so the governor calls a special session on public safety, and the legislators, mainly the Democrats, went up there to. And they didn't do anything. They had an opportunity live in this moment to try to solve crime, and they did not do it. The consequence should be do not vote for them again. The Republicans went up there. They have no power. So they were there. They were ready to hear the bills on crime. They I think, some of the legislation. Yes, they did. And if they, but they can't control whether it's heard or not. So they were there ready to work. And what happened is the Democrats said, no, nope, we're going to adjourn. So none of the crime bills were even heard. And I think right now they're already in the field sending out mailers saying that they are working to solve the crime problem. And my answer to that is you had an opportunity in July on the 18th and you did nothing. So what you're saying on these mailers is not true. The only reason you're discussing crime right now is because you think you're going to lose. Because of an election. Tell us about your district. <clears throat> I know you're born in the North Valley, I am. raised. You told us the dirt road at the end of the dirt road. Um, where is that district? Where is the North Valley, District 18? Well, so, so I was born and raised in the Valley, but District 18 is in the Heights. And it is, uh, it's kind of a funny <laughs> district. It's like they rolled out the dough and they took some uh, cookie cutters out of kind of uh, honestly, Republican strongholds. <laughs> and so now it's an odd district that goes from uh, Academy and Wyoming, kind of up to Lowell. It goes down Spain, back up to Tramway, and then it kind of follows Manal and, and Candelaria and Comanche oh, down. Oh, way over to Manal and Candelaria from? And it ends at Lomas and San Mateo. Uptown is right in the middle of the district. Um, part of the Northeast Heights is in the middle of the district but it comes at this weird kind of odd angle with a dog leg at an angle across the town. And what's very interesting though, is you might think that, that those districts don't have a lot in common or those precincts don't have a lot in common. The fact is everywhere I go, crime. What crime parks is, are you going to? This week we're gonna be at the but, holiday. But generally, oh, you've been going so to? So we've been going to Oso Grande Park. We were at Hoffman Park last weekend. We have been at um, the Academy Hills Park, and this weekend we're going to be at the Holiday Park um, up on Comanche where the community did you center send is. Out a did you just show up to the park, or do you send out a notice you're going to be there? To we send out a text message oh, and say, please come and meet me on Common Ground. That's Yeah, it's been really a I've nice thing. Okay, well, I like that, because coming to my, this day and age with the crime. No, well, I with ring doorbells, nobody don't. answers. No, this nobody answers. Age, no. no, the gates and the ring doorbells, nobody answers. So this is a way to say, look, I want to hear what you have to say. But it, it's also giving me an opportunity for constituent services. So in my business, it's all about customer care. And if you don't take care of your customers, you're not going to have any business. And I ask people to think, when have you heard from your legislator? Do you even know who they are? Have they ever asked you what you need or what's on your mind? So what I'm doing at the parks is if there is an actionable item that a person like me who's not in office yet, but if there's anything I can do, then I will try to do that. So for instance, a gentleman told me he walks at um, uh, Jerry Klein Park is one of the ones where we were. He walks there because the park where he lives is dangerous. There's too many homeless people and there's crime and needles and he doesn't go there. So he goes to Jerry Klein, but his problem at his place, which was the Mesa Verde Community Center, 
is that the flag was shredded. And he called and he called and he called and nobody would do anything about the flag. So I made a call and I don't know if my call did anything at all. I can't take any credit because I didn't have someone say I'm going to do that. But the fact is the man said something. I made a call. The person I called called somebody. I went to take a picture of the shredded flag for a post and the flag was replaced. And so my, my point was take care of people. I mean, that we're, we're their, the, we, the constituents are the customer of the legislator. And if you never hear from them, then they're not taking good care of you. And that's another consequence. You should not vote for them again if they're not taking care of you. But the state, the city, has a history of just voting the same people in and hoping for something different. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, Curtis yeah, and Johnson? It does. And, and I'm encouraging people to, to not vote for a letter um, but to try to vote on, on issue, you know, find somebody that finds what you find important, important, and vote for that person. And I think if we can make some change on, on, it doesn't mean that you are disrespecting your family by voting a different way if you're voting for somebody who believes like you do. And part of the, the biggest challenge in running for office, honestly, is finding the people. Is people... People live in a bubble of their own creation. You cannot get to their door. You cannot get to their phone. You cannot find people to actually visit with them and learn what's on their mind. So the parks is a way to do it, but I can't talk to all 39,000 people in District 18. Because they don't go to the park. They don't go to the park, and many people are not engaged in politics. If they want more information about you, how do they find it, Kirsten Johnson? KirstenJohnson.com. It's K-U-R-S-T-I-N. It's been misspelled my whole life. It's K-U-R-S-T-I-N Johnson.com. That's my website. You can email me at Kirsten at KirstenJohnson.com. I do respond, and I'm happy to visit with people. Thank you for taking the effort to run for Thank office. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you. Thank you, Kirsten Johnson, who's running for Senate District 18, and she told you where all that is but you can find her easily on the web. I'm Diane Kinderwater. Thanks for watching this program. Have a great week with your family. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater, is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. To comment on today's program or to purchase a copy of any Issues and Answers program, visit sunbroadcasting.org or call us at 505-345-1991.